Hello everyone and welcome to the Gravity Max live stream. This episode is being pre-recorded and we have no guests today. <laughs> so just me. Yeah, just So, hello everyone. I'm Sebastian as usual and we got a fun one for you guys today. Yep. We're going to be talking about what the smallest thing in the universe is, the history of the discovery of the smallest thing and the possible future smallest things. So, it's going to be it's going to be fascinating. So, you may have noticed that we changed this slide and okay, let's let's move on to the next slide and explain why. Yeah. Okay. So, first of all, a disclaimer. This video is not intended for children under 13 years old. If you are under 13 years old, please do not watch this video, as the topics we discuss are meant for those with at least a high school level of education. If you are not 13, you will not understand the scientific topics discussed in this video. Now, that disclaimer is going to have to be at the front of these videos for a while, because the FTC has rolled out some new rules with how YouTube channels are allowed to exist and basically YouTube got in trouble because it was found that there were children under 13 years old on their website and the FTC has this law called COPA that basically makes it so that you can't collect children's data on the internet. It's just this whole thing and it blew up so now we have to have this disclaimer so that people under 13 years old don't watch this video because if they do watch this video then we can't get advertising. So, yeah. Yeah, so that's also why our animated characters have changed to yep. now just us. And um, hopefully this will all like settle down. Like right now, it's it's a pretty hot topic, and there's been a lot of debate over what's going to happen with the future of YouTube and the future of like the FTC's regulations on it. Mm-hmm. Personally, I don't feel like this is going to stick around too long because it really hurts the creators on YouTube and it makes yeah. life, like, tough, to say the least. <laughs> yeah. Um, but I don't see this sticking around for more than a month or two, only because of, like, the backlash from the community. Yeah. Now, I don't want to get into, like, a huge rant about, like, YouTube and how it's run or, like, the FTC or anything, but... As, as you can see, if you talk to any YouTube creator, this was a bad move. Hmm. But, yeah, that's that's all I have to say about yeah. it. Yeah, well, basically, you can get fined up to $42,000 per video if it is found that your content is made for kids and you don't mark it as such. So, that's a big problem because how do you even, like, $42,000, that is a ridiculous amount of money. And how does one even risk that? So I've had to mark all of my old videos as yes, they're made for kids, even though they really aren't all necessarily made for kids. I just wanted to be safe. But now if I want to ever make any money, which thankfully, this is a little funny. Thankfully, I'm not monetized yet, even though I've been doing this for four years. So I don't know how thankful... I should be about that, but thankfully since I'm not monetized and I'm not relying on any YouTube money, I have time to produce videos that will explicitly say, no, these are not meant for children under 13 years of old of age, so that way I have less risk, but it's tricky because the reason we got rid of the characters is because the way that they define the way that the FTC defines something that's oriented towards kids is they say, does it have animated characters in it? They have a ton of other criteria, but that's one of the criteria. And that annoys me because I'm thinking, have they ever seen shows like South Park or any other cartoon show that's obviously not meant for kids? So it's just such a vague rule and it's really not written well. And it's not worth the risk of yeah. losing that much money. Yeah, exactly. So until these regulations like settle down, which I fully expect they will in the next month or two, uh-huh. uh, you guys are stuck looking at us instead of the usual yeah. uh, blue purple. Instead of the characters. Yeah. yeah. So. So, yeah, you want to move on to the flags? Uh, sure. Okay. So, 
visit the Gravity Max website because at this point in time, we're pre-recording this, but by the time that you're watching this, I'm going to have a link to my book on the website. So you can look for that. And the website's just a pretty good place to come and see everything. So you can also follow Gravity Max on social media, on Facebook, Instagram, or Twitter, if you are above 13, or yeah, above 13, of course. I think these apps also have requirements for age, but I'm not sure how well they enforce them either. But yeah, so follow me for reminders about these videos and so forth. <laughs> Also, follow Sebastian on social media, at Carl Marksman. I have one post, and it is the greatest work of modern art of the 21st century. Yep. If you want to see that, then you gotta, you gotta go and follow that account. So, yeah. yeah. We're not gonna give you any more information on what that is. Because <laughs> you have to go and find you gotta it. Find, you gotta find out. Yeah. So, finally, we have a truly dead rock. Available on Amazon. Link in the description. So I'm going to put the link in the description. Yep. <laughs> Once I release it. It's funny. I need to do a few things to get it on Amazon. I'm almost ready to publish. Right now it's Wednesday, so it's the day before. Yeah, I'm we'll um, recording yeah. the past. So. Yeah. <laughs> so it's not live. I'm almost ready to publish. I just need to put in tax and bank information to Amazon so that I don't commit tax evasion and so that they know where to send the profit money. <laughs> so, you know, pretty self-explanatory stuff. But yeah, you should totally buy this book. It's a science fiction novel. And if you or anyone that you know, a relative, a friend, enjoys science fiction, you should buy it for them for the holidays as a gift. And it is definitely a book that is oriented towards people that are 13 and up. Yeah. It's about a high schooler who lives on the moon. So he's 14 years old in the book. So just Bam. skirted past that. <laughs> that was lucky because <laughs> yeah. I didn't know about that. <laughs> didn't know about this new rule that they would be putting in when I was writing this book. So, yeah, it's a young adult novel, I guess. So, Should we move on to uh, yeah. the top of today's video? Yeah, sure. Okay. What so, is the smallest what thing? What is the smallest thing? This video not intended for children <laughs> under 13 years old. Yep, that's the <laughs> thumbnail so that no one under 13 years old clicks on this video. So, yes. yeah. Um, so, what is the smallest thing? This is a, you could uh, call it a part two. Uh -huh. Because uh, Max and I, I actually made this video... Um, what was it, like two years ago? Yeah, probably. Yeah, two years ago where he invited me over to do a voiceover for explaining what the smallest things were in the universe. And this is like two years later, like new and improved version yeah. of that video. Yeah, definitely. And so, yeah. yeah, new and improved version. Yeah, it's pretty funny. That was funny. We made two videos. One was a comedy. It used to be up on my channel, but I think it's too... It isn't even controversial. It's just has a person in it that people get really mad about whenever there's an instance of him. So that's, <laughs> that's why that video is not up anymore. But anyways, this is going to be a fun video because... Oh, yeah. I am super excited for today's topic. Not only because uh, we've already like done this video, but because this is really interesting and simultaneously terrifying. Yep. So, and you'll, ex you'll understand why once we start getting into the crazier particles on this list. Yep. All right. That's well said. So let's get started. History. So there wasn't just, you know, I mean, there's a history of discovery for anything in science. History, yep. I mean, I don't know what I'm going, I don't know where I'm going with this. You know what history is. You know what history is. There's always a history of anything being discovered. Yeah. And like anything in science, 
there's a history for this. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> I don't know where I was going. I think I think everyone knows what history means. So, <laughs> so if you don't know what history means, then click off this video because you're probably not 13 years old. Anyways, there, there we go. So we start with Adams. And so this guy, yeah. this happy looking guy, um, he's known as the laughing philosopher, but his real name was Democritus. And um, the story, well, first he lived from 460 to 370 BCE. Mm -hmm. And the story goes that he was sitting on his lawn, like eating cheese as Greeks do, or as Greeks did back then, and still do to this day. Uh -huh. <laughs> and he was like spreading cheese on his crackers. And he like was dividing his cheese amongst his crackers. And as he's dividing uh, his cheese, he... He looks at it and he's like, I wonder if there's a point where you cannot cut anymore. So he kept dividing his cheese and eventually he like ended up with like a tiny crumb of cheese. And that's where he got the idea for an atom because it comes from the Greek word um, unable to cut or like do not cut because it would be something so small that you are unable to cut it. So that's the first instance of the idea of incredibly like microscopic particles yeah yeah and this is a time when philosophy and science are one and the same so yeah. based on his name did he invent democracy <laughs> democritus I would, I would no hypothesize, i would hypothesize that he had something to do with it okay anyways he f came up with the idea of atoms and as individual pieces that could not be divided further. And it's pretty interesting that this concept has been floating around since before the Common Era. Yep. So, yeah. All right. Yeah. So next up, we got the discovery of the electron, which occurred in the late 19th century. Yep. And for those, 19th century means 1800s, which I always get confused by. It's just such a bad system. It makes sense just by the fact that, yes, it's true, 0 to 99 would be the first century, and then 100 to 101 would be the second, or 100 to 199 would be the second, but it's just, I don't know how it caught on. You know what I mean? Like, yes, it's true, but how would anyone think, this is a good system, this is not confusing in the least bit. So, anyways, late t late 19th century, electrons were discovered as the particles that composed the cathode ray because I think it was Thompson, right? J. Yeah, J.J. Thompson. Yeah, J.J. Thompson was working with a cathode ray, which was like this beam of particles from electricity, and so he put magnets near the cathode ray and pretty much detected that these are charged particles and yep. he dubbed them electrons because well i think because of electricity because this relates to electricity yeah. or maybe he just got the name from absolutely nowhere and jj thompson was a raid uh, was a raving <laughs> lunatic okay maybe that's true too but but the important thing here is that he measured the charge of the particle relative to the mass of the particle, which is interesting because once we discover the other particles, we find that these units of charge are very common. They're very uniform, plus one, minus one, but the units of mass are very different because electrons are very light compared to their charge, and as we see later, protons are not. So, let's move on to the discovery of the nucleus. Yep. So this was the gold foil experiment, which yep. happened in 1911. Yep. So, they, this, uh, who, was, who did this one? This was so, Ernest Rutherford. Rutherford. Yeah, Ernest Rutherford. Ernest Rutherford, um, basically shot alpha particles, as you can see here, out of the alpha particle emitter. Mm -hmm. Great name. Um, he shot them, like, directly at a sheet of gold foil, 
and he expected the alpha particles to basically go right through it, which is that thick line that you see um, going directly through the gold foil. Mm -hmm. But what actually happened was that once in a while, as he was shooting these particles at the gold foil, one of the um, alpha particles would suddenly go in a random direction. Uh -huh. And it took him like two years of doing research, and every time he would shoot these alpha particles at this gold foil, once in a while, a random alpha particle would just shoot off in a random direction. Mm -hmm. So yeah, it took him two years to figure out why this was. And it was because every so often, one of the alpha particles that was being uh, emitted or shot at the gold foil would come too close to the nucleus of a gold atom, and it would get repelled in mm. a different direction. And this was how um, Ernest Rutherford found the nucleus. Yeah. Now, this is interesting because I think we forgot to mention this, is that based on J.J. Thompson's discovery of the electron, he proposed the plum pudding model of the atom. Yes. So the Greek idea of the atom were just, you know, amorphous spheres, you know, just blank, not really having any properties other than I am iron or something. And so then with the discovery of the electron, we found a constituent of the atom. And so Thompson basically came up with this idea that proton that sorry that atoms were loosely positively charged and that they would have negatively charged electrons just floating around within this sphere of positive charge which is interesting and it's kind of weird and it is based on the british food the plum pudding which I have never had, so I wouldn't I wouldn't know how accurate this is. <laughs> and with the discovery of the nucleus, however, we figured out that no, the positive charge is also pretty densely concentrated. It's not just a loose cloud of positive charge. So yeah. So what ended up happening was Ernest Rutherford's Ernest Rutherford's student, Niels Bohr, who you may know from the element Borium, has, he came up with a model, and that was the orbital model. So that was, or the orbit model. So that was just that the electrons, the negative electrons, orbited the positive nucleus in circular orbits. This is basically your classic image of an atom, your classic science textbook image of an atom. But we have found that this is also wrong, but you know, it's, it's, I think, uh, quite a bit closer. So, yeah. So yeah, let's head on to the next one yeah. where we talk about the discovery of the protons and the neutrons, mm -hmm. which occurred in the early 20th century, which is the 1900s. <laughs> yep. Yep. <laughs> Just gotta love that. Also got to love how the company 20th Century Fox is still 20th Century Fox and not 21st Century Fox, but it's been like 19 years. I don't know. That always gets me. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> they have the rights to 21st Century Fox, but they don't use it. I have no idea why. why? I, I have no idea. It's so, it's weird. That is weird. It's like, stop living in the past 20th Century Fox. <laughs> Anyways, so... <laughs> Yeah, do you want to explain this one? Sure. Okay. So basically they used polonium, PO source, to emit alpha particles, which is basically radioactive decay. So they used these radioactive particles and shot them at beryllium atoms. And those beryllium atoms released some unknown radiation. This unknown radiation was not charged. There was no charge. And it was just peculiar. It evaded discovery. They did not know what it was. So they stuck some paraffin wax in front of it and found that it was releasing some other particles when hit with the unknown particles. And these other particles were charged, so they were able to figure them out. And they were like, okay, the, these are protons. So then the unknown radiation, they later found out to be neutrons based on the 
way that the protons were ejected, they figured out the mass of the neutrons and they discovered these two nucleons. So, yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, that's basically how it worked. Yeah. And, yeah, I find it interesting that they found the nucleus before the like protons and the neutrons and yeah. these um like here we have it happened in the early 20th century and before the gold foil experiment was in 1911 mm -hmm. these two experiments happened almost like one right after the other like this experiment um happened almost directly after the gold foil experiment just for reference hmm. wow yeah so it's pretty interesting because they had this problem where they didn't know why the mass and the charge of all of the atoms were just seemingly unrelated because if you think about it, the mass of the hydrogen atom is one and it has a atomic number of one, but then helium has a mass of four and atomic number of two and then lithium is six or seven with an atomic number of three. So they were basically puzzling out why does the mass seem to be unrelated to the charge? Because if, if the nucleus is just made of one particle, then it would be proportional, but it was not proportional. So they were trying to figure that out. And so when they found these two new particles, they realized, oh, okay, that makes sense. You've got your uncharged particle is contributing to the mass and the charged one is contributing to the charge and the mass. So that they figure that out. Yep. So next one. Quarks and leptons. So this was discovered in the 1960s and I added also known as the 197th decade. And we put the peace sign in because yep. it was popular in the 1960s. Definitely. So to discover quarks and leptons they used a particle accelerator to accelerate particle <laughs> to accelerate protons towards each other and have them just crash into each other and s just see what comes out. So basically the premise is they had discovered a ton of hadrons. So on top of the proton and neutron which makes up matter, they discovered the pion, the kaon, the lambda baryon and the g baryon. <laughs> and with these baryons, they were thinking, okay, some there has to be some constituent to these particles that is making them exist the way that they do. And so by crashing them into each other, they're like, we'll find what's in the middle. And then they did. So, yeah, it's pretty interesting. Today there are six quarks, but at first they only thought that there were three. They thought that there were three. They thought three was enough to explain all of these different hadrons, but then they found more hadrons and they're like, oh, okay, we need more. And then they discovered more. And, you know, it's just a, you know, they just scienced. <laughs> and also leptons, it's interesting. The electron was one of the first subatomic discoveries and they have not found any constituents to this day. The electron is an elementary particle, which is yeah. interesting. So, yeah. Contemporary. Yeah. So, so, let's head on to the next one. Yeah. Yeah. The standard model. These are two representations of the standard model. And I think the one on the left is obviously easier to look at and just obviously. understand instantly what the standard model is all about. <laughs> so, yeah, this, yeah. if you guys this this was shown at the end of one of our previous streams i forget which one it was. i think the periodic table stream yeah it might have been that one but this we are going to tackle this or give just a an attempt to yeah tackle this. we're going to be um defining variables we're going to be uh like trying to figure out and comprehend like what this means and we're going to be dissecting it as best we can um, <laughs> yeah. in a future stream yeah we've started looking at this and it is it's 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 something i think you'll be able to see the comedy in it because we have, we have <laughs> dumped this like 
the monster equation or just yep. simply the beast. Yeah. Because of how just honestly like fourth dimensional this equation is. Yeah, it's just ridiculous. Yeah. But we have the other representation of the standard model yep. which you see, right? Which is vastly easier to understand. <laughs> yeah. So you have three generations of matter and then you have some bosons. So we're going to go over them one by one, kind of like how we did the elements one by one. So yes. they're not all one by one, but you know, there's only 17 first, of these. So yeah, easy. so first off, oh, we're yeah. going to get what units we're using mm -hmm. for measuring all these things. So uh, for the mass, we have electric volts uh, over um, C squared, which is the speed of light squared. Yep, and that's interesting and because... Since E equals MC squared, M equals E over C squared, so it is literally a valid unit of mass to just have energy divided by speed of light. And also, to understand how small this unit is, those on the right are our two weights in electron volts over speed of light squared. So, you know, that's 10 to the 37. So, and in this, yeah. So the way that we measure charge, like usually with charge, it's like, you know, like uh, plus one or like minus one. That's what you usually see with like protons and uh, electrons. But mm -hmm. there is actually a unit. And I, for, I forget how to pronounce that. How do you say it? Like I think it's coulombs. Yeah. Yeah. Coulombs. So that's your equation for, or that's the, that's the unit for yeah. what we measure charge in, if you ever wondered. Yep. Yeah. So then finally we get to spin, which is measured in 10 to the negative 34 kilogram meter squared per seconds. Mm -hmm. And I don't really know what that means. So, I don't think I will ever know what that yeah, means. Yeah. But with the second one, the or... That's the like the h bar, yeah. which is a variable in physics yep. over two pi. This is you all always see spin expressed as one half or one or zero or sometimes even like the negatives. Yeah. Um, but spin spin is super like weird. And yeah. We'll get into why it's so weird later yeah. on. Yeah. Because it's, it's just... like not actually spinning, but it's spinning. It's strange, but with. With the um, the h bar over two pi, that is it always spits out like that value. Mm. It's like the angle that it's spinning at over like two pi will always give you that one half that's expressed. Yeah. If something has a one half spin. Yeah, it's just really weird the whole situation. <laughs> yeah. With spin, spin is just such a weird concept, and it's hard to understand. And its name does not make it easier to understand. It just confuses people. Uh, should we move on, or do you want to talk about spin? Um, I think we'll get to spin. Okay. As we can. Cool. So let's head over to the up quark. Yeah, the up quark. So the up quark is what makes up half of the protons and neutrons. There are two up quarks in a proton and one up quark in a neutron. And then there's also down quarks, but we'll get to those later. So the up quark is the lightest of all quarks. It is the most stable as a result of that. So, so everything yeah. decays, or at least a certain amount of things decays into yeah. the up quark. Yeah, all of the quarks decay into up quarks eventually. Except on rare instances, sometimes you'll have an up quark decay into a down quark. But that's only if you have a nucleus with too many protons because then it's more stable yeah. if it's as a neutron so up quark it has a charge of positive two-thirds which is just a little sad because they discovered the electron first and were like okay this will be our base unit but if they had discovered quarks and if they have discovered quarks first they might have given the quark the up quark a charge of two and the down quark a charge of negative one and then have everything based on that and it would have been a lot easier for particle physics but now you got to say thirds every time so the spin of an up quark is one half yep and it is 
Uh, the up cork, uh, as we said, is the lightest of all corks. Mm-hmm. So it is a very light weight. Um, and yeah, it is quite a stable particle. Yeah. That's, uh, I give this. I give this an A. If we're gonna do the <laughs> yeah. A. A. Nice. A. Yeah. So along with the down quark, which I just changed the slide for. Along with the down quark, these two particles make up protons and neutrons. So there's, you know, a proton is two up quarks and a down quark. A neutron is two down quarks and an up quark. And the charges cancel out because two-thirds plus two-thirds minus one-thirds gives you the plus one of a proton. And minus one-thirds minus one-thirds plus two-thirds gives you the neutrality of the neutron. So the down quark is a bit heavier than the up quark. And left alone, left to its own devices, it will decay into an up quark. But you can influence it so that it's stable. Because if down quarks always decayed into up quarks, then there would just not be anything other than hydrogen. And then furthermore, just not be anything. <laughs> so, Because the down quark in a proton doesn't decay into an up quark because it's more stable as a proton than as the other particle it would become, which is a weird hadron with a plus two charge, which is just odd. And also in neutrons, down quarks will not decay if you're in an atom because decaying will cause the atom to break apart, and that is not a lower energy state. It's all about energy states here. Ma on this scale, mass is just, you can just throw away mass to and replace it with energy and just arrive at a lower energy state. It's really interesting. With When these particles decay, they start off as massive particles that are moving slowly through space, and then they lose mass and gain kinetic energy. So then they become small particles moving quickly through space. So the quantum, the quantum world is an interesting one. Yes, and we yeah. have a quantum mechanics stream, if you want. Oh, yeah. Yep. Uh, episode 3. So, go check that out. Okay, so the electron. The electron is another fundamental particle. We talked about it a bit earlier. They are what allows chemistry to happen. Yeah, easily <laughs> so, S rank. Easy S. Yeah, definitely. Electrons are fun. They, I mean... All of the chemistry of the natural world, everything that exists, all the, all the compounds, it's because of electrons. Electrons really give atoms their properties. They say that it's the proton that gives an atom its property, but that's just because the proton attracts electrons. Ooh. Yeah, because <laughs> the electrons decide everything. They decide what chemical bonds can be made and... Well, that's everything, <laughs> you know. Yep. There's also <laughs> nuclear chemistry. Yes, nuclear chemistry is decided by the protons and neutrons, but, you know, this glass on this table next to me is not going to go under nuclear fusion or fission anytime soon. So that means that the electron is more important for this cup. So maybe uranium and some of those elements are the only ones that have that have protons and neutrons that matter more than the electrons, but, you know, it is what it is. So electrons, negative one charge, they are the lightest, well, they're the lightest of their type of lepton, because there's a lighter lepton, but it's, it's weird. <laughs> in, their, in their little row, they're the lightest, which means that all of the other leptons heavier like to decay into electrons, so the muons and the taus will decay, they will lose mass and become electrons. So, yeah. So, um, are, yeah. Is the up quark more massive than the electron? Let's check. Yeah, let's check that. Because the up quark has a mass of 2.2 mega electron volts per speed of light squared. The electron has 0.511 mega electron volts per speed of light squared. So they're actually comparable, which is interesting because you always think protons 
what is the scaling factor? I think it's 1800 times more massive than an electron. And so if a proton is just made of two up quarks and a down quark, you're thinking that's maybe 16, 20 times more massive than the electron. What gives? It's basically the binding energy of the proton and the neutron, for that matter, is so high that it is enough mass to make the particles more massive. So that's interesting. Yeah, it's, it's very odd. It's 99% of your mass is just energy from quark binding energy and strong nuclear force interactions, which is just yeah. odd. So if, if you ever feel down and yeah. you said you don't have the energy to do something, <laughs> why? Yeah, that's a lie. The 99% energy. You, yeah, no excuses. No excuses. So the electron, since the electron is a lone particle, it's a fundamental particle, there is no binding energy here. So it does not get that boost. So it's tiny. But S rank. Two, yeah, two. definitely. It, it being just absolutely like alpha and not as in alpha. <laughs> yeah. But alpha. Yep. Nice. So I'm going to go to the next slide. So electron neutrino. Electron neutrinos are basically, well, neutrinos in general, there's not a lot of difference between the neutrinos. So they are chargeless leptons that were predicted yeah. because we were a little confused about some nuclear reactions and some weak force interactions, and we wanted to figure out what was going on, and then it was later discovered, which is interesting. A lot of the time, something is predicted because of the way that the laws work and the math of the whole situation goes, and then you discover it, which is always incredible to make a prediction just based on pure math and then discovering something because of it. So basically there are a few laws of conservation when it comes to reactions that occur. You might know law of conservation of mass. Mass cannot be created or destroyed, which is not entirely true because it can be turned into energy, but that's because the full version of this law is that mass and energy cannot be created or destroyed. They can be converted into each other but that's, that's one conservation law. Another is conservation of charge. So if you have a charged particle and it decays into a non-charged particle, there needs to be a decay product that carries that charge still. You can't just yeah. change the charge of things in the universe. That would be ridiculous. So... Just absolutely just yeah, unacceptable. Unacceptable. So then there's another conservation law, which is conservation of quark number which is very self-explanatory. It's you cannot change the number of quarks that there are. And each quark carries a quark number of one, pretty rightly so. And the antiparticles of quarks, antiquarks, carry a negative one quark number. So as long as you spontaneously create a quark-antiquark -quark pair, there's no problem. And as long as you just leave the number of quarks the same, there's no problem. So you cannot change the number of quarks. So then scientists were thinking, oh, okay, there's got to be a conservation of lepton number two. And then they looked at some reactions, and there just kind of wasn't. And they're like, no, this shouldn't be. There has to be one. So they predicted, okay, there's got to be this very tiny uncharged particle that is missing in our equations. Because the only factor they were missing was lepton number. They the charge of all these reactions were fine. Everything was just everything was working except for the lepton number. So they figured okay, there has to be a particle that has very little mass, so that's why we didn't detect it. Like very little mass doesn't alter the equation much and no charge and just carries a lepton number as its main function. And that was the neutrino and then they found them streaming off of the sun, you know, millions, billions, constantly going through you just because they're so lightweight and that they just fly through everything. They can fly through lead, just keep going for a while. They, can, they fly through the planet, which is just crazy. All 12,000 kilometers of it. Yep. So, yeah. Electron neutrinos. Yeah, I give Electron Neutrino 
I, I give it I give it C rank only uh-huh. because I can't handle the neutrino style. Yeah. <laughs> yep. Yeah. Neutrinos they feel they feel a bit like a cheat, but then I mean I guess they found it because they were basically just they had a hole in their equation and they're like, let me just add this so that the equation works. Which is yeah. like I mean, many scientific discoveries are made that way. But it can also lead you astray, so you gotta be careful with the assumptions that you make. Because you know what they say about assuming. Yeah. It's bad. Yeah. yeah. We don't need to say it, <laughs> but you know what they say. And if you don't know what they say, then you're probably 13 and get off of this stream. Because I don't want to be fined $42,000 because of you. So get off this stream. So. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> For at least a month or two. Yeah. Leave. Yeah, get get out of here. <laughs> Go on, get. get. Go, and, boy. <laughs> yeah. Right. Anyways, the yeah. Charm quirk. Nice. The charm quirk. <laughs> not that kind of charm. Yeah, not that kind of charm quantum mechanic. But, you know... <laughs> He's got the right idea. The charm quirk is just named that because they decided to name it that. <laughs> the names don't really have much truth here. The names aren't very good, I gotta say. The quirk names, they're not the best. And we're, we're gonna go, we're gonna talk about um, misnomers and oh, yeah. in a future stream. Yeah, in a couple weeks. So, yeah, the naming here. Not the best, because electron makes sense, because you've got electricity, and then you get neutron makes sense, because it's neutral. Things like the positron, it's positive, so it's it's just like, come on. What's so charming about this point particle? Like, I, I, I'm, not, I'm not that charmed. I'm not that charmed. The only charming thing on this slide was the quantum mechanic, and now he's gone because of the animation, so... <laughs> Yeah. yeah. So, so this charm quirk, yeah, little little misleading. Um, yep. If you were to look at it somehow, it would just look pretty much the same as any other particle, only it would mm-hmm. be bigger. Well, it would be um, smaller. Well, I mean, uh, more massive. With the, with the other quarks, it's um, the third most massive of all the quarks. Yeah. Well, the thing here is actually that quarks get smaller as they get more massive for some reason really? yeah they I did not know that. they basically get denser and their sphere of influence closes and gets smaller and it's oh. it's kind of weird it's like they're collapsing in on their own mass but that's not really a thing on this scale they're just kind of you know it's just odd <laughs> they just that get smaller nice. so do you learn something new every day yep Hopefully from this stream, yeah. So yeah, Charm Quirk it is basically just a heavier version of the Up Quirk that eventually decays into the Up Quirk through the Strange Quirk, which is the next one that we'll talk about, but we'll get to that in a moment. Basically, all of these quirks decay into Up Quirks. They have this little path that they go through. So you've got Top Quirk to Bottom Quirk to st- Charm quirk to strange quirk to up quirk. It's a long journey. And it happens in a fraction of a second. So the charm quirk, I don't know much about it. There's a lot more to say about the strange quirk. Um, I, was, but... I, was looking, I was looking at the uh, origin of the name. Yeah. Charm quirk, and right now the, the leading theory is that it made the mathematics behind... All quarks work like a charm ah. because it it fitted absolutely perfectly with the theories of quarks, which that, were then proved. That's nice. So yeah, it worked like so a charm. So maybe there is something charming about the charm quark. Yeah. So should we head over to the strange quark? Yes. Named strange because of its strangely long lifetime. Ah. Because it it sticks around a lot a long time. Relatively and, before Yeah, <laughs> and by a long time, what are we looking at here? Yeah, like seconds, uh-huh. even less, microseconds. 
So what are the other quirks for reference? What uh, are they? Sorry, what are you saying? So what are the decay times, what are the half-lives of the other quirks? Oh, I can tell you. Cool. Do some filler. Yeah. Oh, okay, okay. So, so the strange quirk is an interesting one. It was one of the first proposed in the original quirk theory with the three quirks. You had the up quirk, the down quirk, and that third one was the strange quirk. So the strange quirk is a heavier version of the down quirk because it also has a negative one-thirds charge. And it can be found in some interesting hadrons. And there's a very interesting type of matter that could be spawned from the strange quirk. But I think we'll get to that after. Did, did you get the data? I am looking at it. This is the most convoluted thing <laughs> I've ever Googled. Uh -huh. No one can give me just a, a straight, straight answer. answer. Give me a second. Yeah. Okay. I'm going to go into the Wikipedia page. Okay. So I'll, I'll just narrate my journey. Okay. So first, I tried the standard, mm -hmm. which was just Google it. Yeah. Um, and then they decided that, no, we're not going to tell you how long it takes for something to, for a quark to decay. Uh-huh. And then I'm like, okay, Google. Okay, boomer. Okay. Let me let me search some sites. So now I'm scrolling through Wikipedia. Uh-huh. Like reading as fast as physically possible. And there's still not even telling me. Wow. Let me, let me let me let me whip out my secret weapon, the control F. Ooh, control F. That is the secret For weapon. Lifetime. Let's go. This is the Odyssey. The new Odyssey. This is the Odyssey. Now it's, now it's given me a, an equation to figure out the half-life. <laughs> what? Just give him the half-life. Just give me the half-life. That's crazy. Well, anyways, so... Yeah, um, I would expect it to... Oh, look. What? Give me your guess. Give me your guess. I'm going to say... How long for a... How long uh, for a strange quark to decay? I'm going to say microseconds... Yeah. It's probably going to be like, I don't know, something crazy. Uh, These uh, things decay really okay, fast. Okay, here we go, here we go, here we okay. go. Okay. I finally found some shank site. Like, okay. Actually, you got a dot .com, dot .whatever, dot .whatever. Oh, uh -huh. okay, it's a .edu. Okay. okay, .edu is good. Here we go. So, down court. So they give me the mean lifetime in seconds. So a down cork has a mean lifetime of 900 seconds. Yep, it's a 15 minute particle. It's interesting. 15 yeah. minutes of fame, 15 minutes of down cork. <laughs> yep. A strange cork has a lifetime of 1.24 times 10 to the negative 8 seconds. Wow. So that's nanoseconds. That's yeah, pretty pretty short. Like ten. Um, but so what are the compared others? Compared to the other ones, such as the charm cork, a charm cork has a lifetime of one point one times ten to the negative twelve seconds. Wow. And a bottom cork has a lifetime of one point three times ten to the negative twelve. Seconds. Wow. So that is strangely long lifetime. That is ten to the four times. That is ten thousand times longer. Of lifespan. Still ridiculously quite short, but... Strange. Yeah, quite strange. So, this is this is actually pretty interesting, because a longer lifespan for a particle really just means more stable. So, next to the up quark and the down quark, the strange quark is the most stable quark, which is equally as interesting as it is concerning. And so... Because some scientists, some astronomers, astrophysics, they have hypothesized that at the center of neutron stars, there might be enough pressure from gravity that particles are, that these quarks are more likely to become strange quarks than remain up quarks and down quarks. Because, as I said, the strange quark is more massive, but it is smaller. You know, it is yeah. smaller. So 
If you're being very densely crushed, becoming smaller would be advantageous. So, strange quarks might be the lowest energy state at the center of neutron stars, which would mean that all of the up and down quarks would become strange quarks. And so, that's interesting, but yep. here's the concern bit. When two neutron stars crash into each other, they eject material all over the universe. And if some of that strange quark material from the center gets out and it lands on some planet, then it would start converting the matter of that planet into strange quarks. Because once you have enough particles that once you have enough particles of strange quark that you have a macroscopic lump, like as long as it's not just a single particle, you know, like alone divided, they are weak, but together they are strong. And they will, they are in such a good energy state that they will be able to convert the up and down quarks into strange quarks just from contact, which would not be good if that happened here, because then everything would become strange matter as it's termed. It would become strange quarks, and since strange quarks are smaller, it would just become a dense glob of substance it would not be good so that's that's strange quirks yeah very strange <laughs> very strange yeah so i've been trying to find so our next uh particle is the muon yep um the muon i've been trying to find <clears throat> the decay time for this one uh -huh. but apparently that is locked away in Area 51. They don't want anyone to know how long it takes. Um, yep. I do have a theory okay. that it's something around 2.19 to the negative 12th, but that's just a theory. Uh, how did you arrive okay. How did you arrive at that theory? Because that's that highly theory? specific. It threw an equation at me, and I plugged my oh, favorite no. numbers into it. No. <laughs> oh my gosh. Well, the muon the muon is a heavier electron and it will decay into the electron because as I said, particles don't like to have mass, they like to have energy. So, energy oh, is it's actually 2.19 yeah. times 10 to the negative 6 seconds. Ah. Wow. So, there we go. This is the one that's in microseconds. So this is a pretty long-lived particle in the grand scheme of things. It is. Even though microseconds. <laughs> but, yeah. yeah. Muons, muons do interesting things. There was this cold fusion hypothesis, this cold fusion idea, where if you used muons in place of electrons, then it would be easier for particles to fuse because basically the muon... Let me go to its mass. The muon is more massive than the electron. The muon has a mass of 105.66 mega electron volts, which is quite a bit. That is quite a lot, actually. It's comparable to the proton, I think. It it gets into the it gets into that range, you know. It's not ridiculously small. But it's, I don't think it's more massive than the proton, but it's, it's quite, it's quite hefty. It's quite hefty. So an absolute unit. An absolute unit. So if you replace the two electrons of a hydrogen atom with two muons, then the elect, then the uh, hydrogen atoms would fuse at a lower temperature, hence cold fusion, which would be highly lucrative. If anyone can yeah. figure out cold fusion, they will be, I don't know, they will be the richest person alive. Yeah, it, it'll be a highly valuable technology. Yeah. So, that's the muon. Any, do you have any other muon anecdotes? Um, personally, uh, I have not met any muons face-to-face. -face. Hmm. Um, I do feel that they are beneath me. The doom shing. Um, but, 
You know, on the cheer list, I would I would throw this at a solid B because there hmm. are definitely some hefty boys, but um, nothing nothing too special. Hmm. B tier. Nice. <laughs> <laughs> so then the next one is the muon neutrino. Now yes. I'm gonna check, but I'm pretty sure the neutrinos pretty much they have pretty similar well there are different masses the muon neutrino is quite a bit heavier than the electron neutrino it pretty much follows the same trend that the particles of their namesake have so muon neutrino but it's it's interesting as neutrinos travel through space they just kind of oscillate between each form of neutrino so just based on a whim, however they feel, they're like, I'm going to turn into a tau neutrino now, and now I'm going to turn into a electron neutrino, and now a muon neutrino. So it's inconstant, because the neutrino masses are so small. The electron neutrino is the least massive particle before you become light, so which is massless. So it's just very, very interesting how with such little mass, the quantum properties, you know, just keep getting weirder to the point where you can just oscillate between different states of how much mass you have because you're just, you know, siphoning off energy and then recreating energy and yeah, quantum particles. Once you get to this scale, everything just turns on its head. Yeah, quantum mechanics and you can go back to our quantum mechanics stream, as I said earlier. Um, seemingly random stuff happens on the quantum scale. Like, yep. the particles will just randomly, like, spaz out and, like, move in a random direction. Yeah. And not all people know why. You can also read The Elegant Universe by Brian Greene, I think. Yep. Not, not Hank Green, Brian Greene. Um, he details the probability spectrum of like how you can try to predict where an electron is mm -hmm. but then there are also some employed principles like the heisenberg uncertainty principle and all of that but point in case the quantum world is a strange one mm. yeah like no doubt yeah definitely so i'm gonna go to the next particle yes the top quark the heaviest and smallest of all quarks. It is not, it was not part of the original quark hypothesis theory. It's in the out group. Yeah, it was discovered later. There's something like 60 hadrons now. There's a ton of hadrons that we know of. So many hadrons. And with all these hadrons that were discovered after quarks were discovered, we found, oh, okay, there's got to be some more massive quarks to make up these different hadrons, and the top quark is one of them. So, positive two-thirds charge, heaviest version of the up quark. Uh, you probably want to uh, say the number again. You probably want to change that number. You said 40? Yeah, so that, that's my cousin that you hear. Uh-huh. Uh, that's Shane. And... Uh, he sees me Googling, and we're looking at how many hadrons there actually are. So thank you, Shane, for being a guest on the stream. And, yep. And, I guess we um, did have a guest. How many hadrons are there? Right now, they're predicting 468 hadrons. Oh, wow. No, no there are 468 hadrons. And oh, and the anti-hadrons. Oh, wow. There's 468 anti-hadrons. So, yeah. Like, no, over 900. Yeah, hmm. so over... Like nine hundred and thirty-six, like hadrons, like total. Yeah, so, not all of them are discovered, though. That's that's yes, right. yes, not all of them are discovered, but we we can predict over nine hundred of them. Hmm. Just somewhere wow. in the universe. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah. So thank you, Shane. Yeah. yeah thanks. <laughs> <laughs> so. Um, yeah. Go ahead. Well, I was just gonna ask anything else about. Top course? Yeah. Um, where do you think they would go on the tier list? I feel like it's been mainly me throwing them on the list. Where, uh -huh. where, where do you feel that top quark should go? Well, the top quark, I don't know. It's just, it's it's too unstable. 
They have the fastest decay time. They you don't like it. what? You don't like it. I I'm not I'm not sure I like it. I don't know. It's just <laughs> it's not I don't know. It's just what does it do really? It it decays too quickly and as a result the hadrons it's part of decays too quickly, but it's helpful to study physics with these hadrons, but they don't have much practical application. You know what I mean? Like the strange quarks, they could become strange matter and destroy everything, which is a pretty practical application, if you ask me. Yeah. So. So top quark, like C to D? Yeah. I C, maybe D tier. Are you making a tier list? Should I make the tier list? I could. <laughs> It's just the way that you were saying that, I was... Well, yeah, I, I, was, just, I was just saying, like, the, the hypothetical tier list here. Oh, okay. I'll put, it at the, I'll put it at the end, uh, after slide 32. Okay. It's just the way you were saying it was like you were trying to write it down, you know? Yeah. Here. Oh, I'll paste it in. You can keep talking about our next particle. Okay. Next bottom. particle. The bottom quark. This is the second most massive quark. Not much to say about it. It has a negative one-thirds charge because it's part of the down quark row. So it, just a heavier version. I have similar thoughts about the bottom quark as I do about the top quark. Not very practical. Yeah. Not much, not much to say about them. Yeah. So, yeah. Should I go to the next one? Yeah, my uh, it's out. Oh, okay. Oh, there we go. It fixes itself. Very good. So, the next one is the tau. Pretty much all of these third generation fermions, there's not much to say about them. Tau, heavier version of the electron, just really heavy. Decays really quickly, too. Once we get to this point, it's kind of like the last few elements of the periodic table, where they're just in and out. Mm -hmm. And it's just like, what do I do with this? <laughs> What do I do with this? Well, in quick review, of yeah. Cork, where is that going on the tier list? I think you said B. I think I did say B. Um, of Quarks, they're very stable. Very, very good guys. Uh -huh. You know? Yep. Um, not a lot to them, but they're, they're good in their own rights, you know? And yeah. He, and Of Quarks is the type of guy that you would invite over to your barbecue, but not to your sister's birthday, you know what I'm saying? Uh-huh. I feel you. I get it. So, that, he's, he's got to go on B tier. Okay. So, down quark. All right, down quarks. Down quarks, I'm not, I'm not feeling them as much as up quarks, because down hmm. quarks, eventually, they just become up quarks, right? Uh-huh. So, so, C? Uh, they're, 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 yeah, they're kind of useless, you know? When you have Whoa. up quarks... They, they make up half of all nucleons. Okay, but like, who needs nucleons, you know? I think everyone needs <laughs> nucleons. <laughs> so, uh, I'll put that right up next to uh, Up Quarks because All right. they, see, they seem to be close and I wouldn't yeah. want to be one to separate them. Yep. The Doom Chain. But yep. <laughs> <laughs> They're equally important. Uh, yeah. You do kind of need one for the other. Yeah, that's true. And it's spazzing. On okay. So I'm going to keep going. Um, yeah, yeah, keep going. Okay. I'll, I'll figure this out. Okay. Don't worry about so it. tau neutrino, again, all of these third generation particles, the tau neutrino, especially for the neutrinos, it doesn't really matter because they just oscillate between each other. So th this is just the last row, you know. I think these guys, these guys get like the bottom tiers, got to say. Anyways, so then we move on to something interesting, the gluon. This oh, is... Boy. Them gluons. This is... These guys are confusing as anything. Yeah, they are pretty confusing. The gluons are our first boson of the night, or the morning, because we're recording in the morning, but of the night, because you guys are listening at night. <laughs> and the gluon is the carrier of the strong nuclear force, so it is what keeps quarks together in hadrons and it is what gives us all of that binding energy that makes us so massive yeah so 
So, yeah, gluons make things stick, almost like... Glue. Oh, yeah, glue, I guess. Yeah, that's why they they named it that. Did I I, I mess up a joke? (laughs) No, 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 you did it perfectly. Thank you. Okay, so... (laughs) So the gluon comes in six types, and or eight types. Uh, Maybe eight. Okay, so yeah, this is what we were debating about. So if you look over to the right on your screen, you're gonna see all those janky equations. Yeah. Um, in layman's terms, if you see a line over uh, one of those letters, it means anti. Yep. So for that first equation, you see all the way at the top in parentheses, it says red anti blue plus blue anti red. Uh, in parentheses, over the square root of 2. And that is the top... Wait, yeah. oh, I think it's the top right guy, actually. But it's one of those. Yeah, but basically, um, like, it can be a color, and then an anti-color, and then it matches with, like, the opposite. Yeah. Which is, like, the base thing. My contention is mm. with the red anti-red. Yeah. Because I don't know how that can even exist. And the fourth equation you see and the eighth equation you see correspond to those two white ones you have yeah. at the bottom. They're janky. They're, They're weird. They're janky to say the least. Yeah. So the six ones make sense a bit more intuitively. They actually yeah. have some intuitive logic. So the way that the strong force works is that these particles, the quarks, have color charges. And they're not intrinsic properties, these color charges. They can, they flow and flux, but basically, since you have three quarks in a hadron, each of them is a different primary color, red, green, or blue. And these are computer primary colors, not art primary colors. So red, green, and blue, RGB, like the pixels. And when you mix red, green, and blue on a computer, you get white. So it's colorless. So that's why the protons and neutrons are colorless and don't have to deal with the strong nuclear force. So basically, these colors change, and the way that they do is pretty interesting. Let's say, for example, that you have a red color-charged quark, and that red color-charged quark releases a red anti-blue gluon. Your red-colored quark will become blue colored now because it just lost red and it also lost anti-blue. Losing anti-blue is the same as gaining blue, right? Like that makes sense. So the quark becomes blue. Now what happens is this gluon, this red anti-blue gluon, is attracted to the other blue quark in this hadron. And so it goes to that quark and gives it red anti-blue. The anti-blue cancels out with the blue, and the red remains. And so now it's red. And they've swapped colors and become attracted to each other with an attractive force. So it's pretty interesting and intuitive. And then you get to the white ones, and it's just, what? And it's terrible. (laughs) It's absolutely horrible. And it's, what is going on? This was a nice system to explain things, and you ruined it. You ruined it. So... Yeah, gluons, I don't know. I don't know about gluons. I would give them mixed, I have mixed feelings about them. Yeah, right now I was going to throw them on C tier. Because, yep. like, strong... Seems pretty apt. Of course, it's, it's pretty, it's, it's important. Yeah. Don't get me wrong. It's important. But, they don't have to be such tricks about it. They yeah, exactly. The most whacked out, impossible math ever. Yeah, I mean, honestly, like root six, what, how does root six have anything to do with this? And then you have to employ, now, you have to employ the uh, negative I, mm-hmm. which seriously oh, makes yeah. me believe that they are employing the use of, like, other dimensions to this thing, because yeah. that's really the only way, and I'm not, I'm not, I'm not being sarcastic, I'm not yeah. like... This map can only work in a different dimension. I'm being yeah. like legitimately serious. That's how some quantum mechanic uh, equations work. Yeah. They need the existence of other dimensions. That's the only way I see these equations working uh-huh. because they they look very similar 
to yeah. the stuff I dealt with when I was in uh, my quantum mechanics courses. Uh huh. And yeah. What did you learn from those equations? From the equations that are on the gluons, or what I learned at Yale? Uh, at Yale. Oh, at Yale, I learned that everything doesn't exist unless you see it, uh -huh. and everything that you don't see exists. But did you do any equation work? Um, I we looked at the uh, like I said earlier, the Heisenberg uncertainty principle. Oh, okay. And, um. Basically, some other fundamental principles of math explaining why they are the way they are. Okay. That's um, interesting. Uh, yeah. And is that supposed to be I as in the square root of negative one? I believe so. Okay. Now, that's just weird. And the it's reason is, very... in my math classes, my teachers, whenever they bring up I, they say, oh, this has no practical application. This, is, this wouldn't be used in the real world. They're imaginary numbers. And then, lo and behold, quantum mechanics comes in here and just says, haha, I'm going to use I'm gonna use them anyways. And it's like, what are you doing, quantum mechanics? These are not the numbers that you're allowed to use. Yeah, quantum mechanics does not care. Like, yeah. To, to quantum mechanics, it do not matter. It just simply do not. Mm -hmm. That's that, that should be your mindset when going into uh, quantum mechanics if uh -huh. you're going to study that as a field. Like, you just got to learn to accept some things just be like that. And then yeah. you just got to understand that quantum mechanics is then going to turn those things on its head. Yeah, the more I look at this, the more I get attracted to astrophysics. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah you as opposed to particle physics. With all the yeah, but they're all tied together in the end, so... That's very true. But, you see, I think it'll make sense once we get to that level, because right now, I mean, we haven't even taken, like, physics in high school. <laughs> We're just running on background knowledge right now. Yeah, we are. But once we have those classes, then we yeah. will be able to have better information. So, the glue on. I think the glue one. one. The glue. Anyways, next particle, the photon. I love these guys. Yep. Um, you'll see on the tier list, I put them pretty high. Hmm. Uh, I love them. They're, yeah. they're just all around good guys. They let you see stuff. They are the particles of light. Yep. And they're incredible. Yeah. Photons. Photons are fun because they can travel long distances and. They are pretty practical. You don't see the glue on making up a sense in the human anatomy, you know? Vision works on photons. And also, photons are what allow this video to get to you. Yes. Humble viewer. And it is through the computer. So, photons actually carry electromagnetism. That is why they are called electromagnetic radiation, and they fall on the electromagnetic spectrum. Yeah, I bet in science class, when you saw those words, you're just thinking, okay, this is just some weird science word. that they're call Just call it light, teacher. Just call it light. Don't call it whatever the heck you were just yeah. calling it. And, and then now it makes sense because... Basically, they carry electromagnetism, which is charge and magnetism. So, when two electrons approach each other, they release photons. And those photons say, hey, we're negatively charged, and then they repel each other. And you can see that in Feynman diagrams. You can see, you can see when two electrons bounce off of each other, they transmit a photon. Even though it's sort of a virtual photon this is something in in quantum mechanics virtual particles they are particles that exist but also don't because there's not enough energy for them to exist they just kind of they just kind of i don't i don't even know how to describe it <laughs> they have effects on the world and yes. the way that particles interact are as if they were there but they're still not there cuz there's not enough energy to be there and it would just be spontaneous creation of energy but 
it's basically if energy is spontaneously created and then spontaneously destroyed, you can kind of lag out the universe, you know? You can, it's like an error. It's like in Minecraft when two people would grab a diamond from a chest at the same time. Yes. Yeah, that's what you're doing with the photons. Basically what you're doing. That's what you're doing with virtual particles. But then the photons that we see are not virtual. They are there. Yes. And they carry energy mostly. But the electromagnetism carrier photons, they are just weird. They're in limbo. Not fully there. So every high school student... <laughs> <laughs> yeah so yeah. that's the photon yeah photons they're great I love them light they, I, uh, sorry let me back up photons are the light of my life ha uh, hit it Michael Mike hit it Mike oh, oh, Michael oh no. he's not here oh. <laughs> <laughs> uh. and the only way to get that would be to watch our last stream but we shouldn't have referenced it because we don't want people to watch the last. No, the last stream was fun. It was. It was you're, fun. You're it was not, a fun you're time. Not, you're not gonna yeah. Learn yeah. That yeah. Stream, yeah. If you're. Much better. Yeah. If you're if you're looking to be cheered up, then watch the last stream. But if you're looking for insightful conversations about aliens, I'll refer you to anywhere else. <laughs> Joe Rogan. Yeah. So, <laughs> I'll refer you to the History Channel. Uh, so, yeah, photons. I'm going to move to the next one. So, Z boson and W boson. I'm going to do these together, just kind of flipping back and forth between them. So, yeah. basically, these are the carriers of the weak force. And the Z boson has a charge of zero, and the W boson has a charge of plus or minus one. So, that's interesting, you know, plus or minus one. Most particles in this list just have a singular charge, but the W boson has both. So, yep. it just depends on what's occurring. So, the weak force is radioactivity, which is kind of weird, because how could radioactivity be a force? But it just is, so accept it. <laughs> it's the weak interaction. So I guess it's not really a force. It's it's odd. It's just this this whole this whole conversation, this whole yeah. topic, is just semantics, pedantics, e everything under the sun. So basically, when a particle decays, when the up quark, when particles decay into the up quark, or when particles decay into the electron, all of these decay processes that I mentioned earlier, they are carried out through the W boson and the Z boson. So, when a down quark decays into an up quark, it releases a W boson with a charge of negative one. And now think of this in terms of conservation numbers. So you start with a down quark, and a down quark has a charge of negative one-thirds. So it becomes an up quark that has a charge of positive two-thirds, which would be inconsistent with the law of conservation of charge. So if you have a negative one W boson, then you're back down to negative one-thirds. So you're good. So then what happens is the W boson very quickly decays into an electron and an anti-electron neutrino. And the reason for that is that the electron carries that negative one charge, so you still have a conservation of charge, and you have an anti-electron neutrino because the anti-neutrino since it's a lepton, but it's an anti-lepton, it has a lepton number of negative one to cancel out the electron's lepton number of positive one. Or sorry, yeah, positive one. So, yeah. it That's just one interaction. It's very complicated, but it, it makes sense. if Just take a look at some Feynman diagrams, basically. That's my recommendation. So, yeah. Anything else to say about these? I absolutely hate these. Wow. Um, you, will, you, you can probably guess where I threw them on the tier list. Oh. <laughs> What's wrong with them? Well, I mean, listen. All of these things, they mm -hmm. all contribute so much to our life as we know it. 
like the four forces, all yeah. of it, our matter, all of it. But C and W, honestly, they're weak. They're just wow. weak. Just like their force. They're weak. Huh. And they're radioactive. Radioactivity makes things less fun. My dream is to pick up a massive block of francium and throw it into the Hudson River and watch, like, every fish die as the water, like, suddenly explodes with the force of, like, 50 megaton bombs. <laughs> uh-huh. But I can't do that. Because francium is radioactive. Because francium is radioactive. Yep. Frankly, I think... I think that's why I like this force. It prevents people like Sebastian from throwing Francium into the Hudson River. <laughs> Which would not be good for everyone else. So, yeah. yeah no, it, it stops me from achieving my dream. Mm -hmm. like, and I, I'm not a fan of it, honestly. Imagine, imagine a ship, right? Just a big boat, a steamer boat, and it's shipping. Realistically, it wouldn't be a full tanker of cesium. So the most realistic thing would be that it's shipping a full tanker of lithium or sodium, which yeah. can still be pretty destructive. Because say that this boat sinks, right? You yeah. would have a massive fire and just explosion as soon as that lithium touched the water. It would not be good. I wonder if they even ship... That material i mean they must maybe they ship it in a form where it's bonded to other materials so that it won't react with the water but you got you, you got to be careful with that stuff you know mm. yeah because maybe they ship it as salt and then unsalt it at sight you know <laughs> they, unsalt. <laughs> they unsalt it so yeah that's 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 that would be interesting but anyway so the higgs boson this is our ultimate particle, the last one yes. in contemporary. What do you think about the Higgs boson? Me and the Higgs boson have a very interesting relationship. Let me tell you why. Uh huh. Why? So there, there is that theory that there is the I believe it's called the Higgs field, where the reason that anything has like is the, the reason that anything is allowed to have mass at all is because of your interaction with the Higgs field. Uh -huh. And we're not really sure how you interact with that Higgs field, but everything that has mass does interact with it. And the Higgs field is made up of Higgs boson particles. Uh -huh. The Higgs, but like, and uh, Max and I made this joke earlier, like, the Higgs boson kind of, like, no clips out of reality. <laughs> yeah. Um, it's, it, like, quantum mechanics, don't get me wrong, it disobeys almost everything we know. Yeah. But the Higgs boson kind of, like, condenses all of that, and he, he does it all. Yeah. Know? Or I should, I should have put a gender on it. The, the, they do it all. Yeah. You know? Yep. So... You'll see where I put it on the tier list, uh -huh. and I'll explain it. Yeah. But Basically, what Sebastian is referring to is the Higgs boson is unique as it has, well, there's a lot of reasons that it is, but one thing is that it is the only particle with a spin of zero. And with the way that spin works, it just is odd. I just... Yeah. It's... A spin of zero. It has a spin of zero. Yeah. Yeah, it's. I think spin was supposed to be two pi divided by your spin number is the yeah. amount of rotations the the number of radians you have to rotate through to come back to the original spot, which for a spin of one makes sense because then that's three hundred sixty degrees and you're all good. That makes sense. But then the spin of half. Is weird because it means that you have to rotate twice to rotate once and that might be what these particles do which is weird but it does imply some string theory shenanigans because if a particle because a mathematical object that we know of already that must rotate twice to rotate once is the Mobius strip yes so it's these particles these particles might be tiny 
extra dimensional Mobius strips and that's why they spin oddly. But with a spin of zero for the Higgs boson, you have two pi divided by zero and you're not supposed to divide by zero. So that's that can be a problem. So the Higgs boson, yeah, carries mass, but it's just kind of weird because yeah. it doesn't even carry gravity. It just carries mass, it's, which... Yeah, it's, a, it's a weird guy. So if you, if you would yeah. present and present again, uh, okay. tonight, your list will go in. Okay. Escape and present. Okay. Let's see. Next slide. Ah. So Look at all these. Let me explain why I made the choices I did. Mm -hmm. So for, first of all, I've labeled all the ones on the B and C because there's a lot of them. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's sometimes hard to tell the two apart. Yeah. I did make so, sure each one was unique. I, I made my system. Yeah. Yeah, you did. So for S tier. Actually, you know what? No, I'm just starting F tier. With the Z all right. and W <laughs> goddamn boson. Uh-huh. Yep. As I said, these guys are the only things preventing me from my dream of throwing <laughs> a chunk of francium into the Hudson River and then dying in a police station. <laughs> uh-huh. <laughs> so yeah, they get F tier. They're weak just like okay. a force. And they are honestly just utter garbage. They are the like they are the quantum they're the they're the particle equivalent of New Jersey. They're just <laughs> Terrible in every single way, uh -huh. and should not even be allowed to join the rest of the group. Wow, that's so pretty e -tier, scathing I review. Threw, yeah, I did, yeah. For E tier, E tier, I feel is like the weirdest one to put anything because, uh -huh. like, when you're when you're graded on a test, you yeah. get A, B, C, D, or F. Right? Where would you so, put your first quarter grade on a tier list? <laughs> <laughs> Um, so for, for E tier, I feel like it's just such a weird tier yeah. to have because it's like terrible, but it's not like the worst, mm -hmm. but it, in and it of itself, E tier is just like elusive, you know, mm. and that's where I put the Higgs boson nice. because the Higgs boson is nothing if not completely elusive. Yeah. I they didn't even discover it until 2013 or something. Yeah, I still put it down on the list because if it turns out that it doesn't, that the Higgs field does not exist, and it doesn't give everything mass in the universe, then, like, come on, man, <laughs> what are you even here for? Yeah. But if we, if we, if the Higgs field does exist, then I will, I will go, I will use my time travel powers. I'll go back and I'll throw this all the way up to S tier. Oh wow! Because that's that's pretty important, giving everything yeah. that. That is pretty important. So the sole thing on the D tier is the muon neutrino. Mm. Muon itself is on the C tier, and as a general rule, I put any neutrinos one tier lower than their particle. All right. Because, like you said, they're kind of a cop out. Yeah. So D tier goes to the muon neutrino. All right. So for C tier, we have the electron neutrino. Yep. The the muon, the top, the the top quark, the bottom quark, and the tau neutrino. And now this, the electron neutrino, is the only one that isn't directly under its uh, equivalent. Uh huh. Uh, that is not a neutrino. Yeah. Um. Again, it's a cop out. It is the lightest. Thing, like we said, it was the lightest thing without becoming light itself. Uh huh. So. I was like, "Come on, man! You're not you're not a photon. Mm -hmm. You're not anything. You get C tier, just okay. slapped right in the middle wow. of the tier list. How just cruel! Absolutely nothing special about you. Your only special thing is that you're like related to one of the <laughs> best particles. So, okay. like, come on, you're not you're not even famous. Next over, we got the muon muons. I feel like they're they they mean well. They're good guys, but mm -hmm. They, they're, they're definitely big, and they're definitely, like, stable. Uh-huh. But I feel like when compared to things such as, like, the Strange Quark, which is just Chad, <laughs> um, or, or, like, the uh, like the Tau, or even the Gluon, I feel like it just cannot compare. Why is the Tau greater than tau, the Tau? I like, I like how it sounds. 
Oh, okay. So, Sensible. Yeah. So, next up on the C tier, we got the top and bottom corks. I feel like they're just middle-of-the-road guys. Like, uh-huh. cool dudes that you might, like, share a drink with one time, <laughs> but then you don't want to talk with them ever again. So, All right. C tier. And, of course, the town neutrino is there just because it's somewhat related to its more popular brother, the town. <laughs> okay. The town. Uh, on B tier, we have the up cork and the down cork. These bad boys are they're they're cool. They're they're partners in crime. Like yeah. down cork, super stable guy. It, like he'll he'll be your accountant till you find one. The up cork is your straight laced rookie, and then your down cork is your hardened <laughs> loose cannon. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. Be the most for a police drama. Yeah, exactly. So next up we got Cal. I uh-huh. like the way it sounds. Yep. Actually, no, sorry. I skipped Charm. Oh, yeah. Charm, you need to have that charm because it just, like the math, it just works like a charm. Yeah. It's, it is a great particle. Mm-hmm. It's an interesting particle. Mm-hmm. And I'm a fan of it. Nice. Next up, we got the Tau. Tau, cool. Sounds cool. I like it. It's cool. Yep. Tau. Yeah. Right. Tau Next is... Up, we got the Gluon. Now, yeah. me and the Gluon have been going back and forth. We've been mm. staring at each other for the, night, for the last, mm. like, 30 minutes, right? And I'm like, Gluon, what do I do with you? And he's like, mm, I don't know, fam, because I have six equations that make perfect sense, mm. and I have two that don't make sense. <laughs> You yeah. know what, Gluon, I'll trust you on this one. I'll trust that those two equations are real and you do actually have eight forms. Okay. And so I'll throw you on B tier, hmm. you know? But if Fair Gluon enough. violates my trust and hmm. it turns out that those last two equations don't work, uh-huh. Gluon, Gluon's getting sent down to F tier. Wow. <laughs> yeah. Wow. Well, maybe, maybe D tier because I do like right. people on the little guy, but, yeah. you know, the little scamp, buttons. the little rascal. The little rascal. He's pushing my buttons. Yeah. So for A tier, A tier is the guys always at the top of the class. You know, mm. A tier is the guys that are just like achievers. They are, they are your friends. They are everything. So of course, right up there in first position with A is the strange quirk. Uh huh. This guy. The only reason he's not. Honestly, in S tier is because he could theoretically destroy the yeah. entire planet in a microsecond. Yep. So he got not, he got docked a tier for that. But mm. other than that, he's a stable guy. He he can't he contributes so much to science, and he's fun to theorize about. You know, there's like yeah. those strange matters, strange the yeah. strange stars, all that. Yeah. He's a great guy. Next up, we got photons. Mm. Photons are incredible. They allow the internet to like work. Yep. They allow everything to be alive. The only reason I docked them a point is because they are what have allowed me to see the horrors of this universe. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> they are, are what caused me to witness all the terrible things I wish I had never witnessed uh-huh. in my life. Have you seen some Lovecraftian horrors? Like I'm, I have, I'm frightened. I've, I've, met, I've met with a terrible fate. <laughs> <laughs> Incomprehensible. Oh my gosh. But anyways, um, all the way at S tier, yep. we got the electron. Nice. Give it up, ladies and gentlemen. The electron. The electron. He is just. He comes in clutch. Like the A, the A tier. They're at the top of their class, no doubt. S tier, the S tier wrote the damn class. Uh-huh. The S tier is both the teacher, the principal, and the school itself. They are uh-huh. everything. S tier is just above everything else, and there is no place for the electron other than the S tier. They allow everything to happen. They make money move. They are the mob boss of mm. the particle world. They, they are the organizers. They are the planners. They are the masterminds. <laughs> Electrons, absolute, like, strange quirk? Yeah, sure, it's Chad. 
Definitely Chad. Okay. Electrons, they're they're Brody. Mm. The only the only thing above a Chad is a Brody. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I I have I, I don't know what that means, but I do know that It's like an alpha Chad. Like Chad's are already like the alphas. Uh-huh. Brodies are are above the Chads. Okay. So thank you for listening to my tier list. Uh-huh. Well, thank you for presenting this. Yes. <laughs> These are some great findings for science. I'm sure the scientific community will take years, years just to reconcile all of this new information. This is the equivalent of when Dmitry Mendeleev introduced the periodic. Exactly. 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 I mean, Mend Mendeleev, come on. How do you even compare to this? Damn. This is the tier list table. So, all right, I'm gonna go to the next slide. So now we've got some technicalities because this video was, what is the smallest thing? And so the plank length <laughs> is the yeah. smallest thing, the just smallest by thing definition. <laughs> like its definition is the smallest thing. So, you know. Thank you so much for watching. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> no, yeah. the, uh, so as you can see here, plank length is the smallest possible distance without like things like fusing. Is that correct? Uh, or is it just the smallest possible distance, like period? Yeah, it's just the smallest possible distance. It's kind of like the frames of the universe, the pixels, yeah. you know what I mean? Yeah, so it's, it is yeah. 1.6 to 10 times 10 to the negative 35th power yep. meters. Which is incredibly Which is tiny. Like, that makes... The Planck length makes all of our quarks look like, I don't know, giant, huge yeah. things. Um, I believe that the analogy is if you um, make one atom the uh -huh. size of our universe, Okay. Um, or either the size of our universe or the size of our solar system, uh -huh. I think I think it might be the solar system. If okay. you make one atom the size of the solar system, yep. a Planck length is the is like a tree. Wow. You know? That's the um I actually want to get the uh, official thing. Alright. But I think that's the analogy that's used and my computer is frozen. <laughs> that's really yeah. interesting. So very tiny objects. Like very minuscule. So and they're not even objects, they're just measurements, units of measure. So, this was basically the distance, the unit of space where if you, were tr if you tried to use a photon to look at anything smaller than a Planck length, the photon would have so much energy concentrated in it that it would just become a black hole, and then whatever you were looking at would be sucked into a black hole, so... It's just, it's too small. And also the Planck length, from the Planck length, we derived a ton of other units. The most notable is the Planck time, which is the amount of time it takes light to travel one Planck length, which is a tiny amount of time. And it is the shortest hypothetical amount of time in the universe because... 5.4 times 10 to the negative 44 seconds. Thank you. Uh, yeah, smallest amount of time in the universe. Nothing could occur on a shorter time frame. And it's interesting because it kind of makes you think of the universe like a simulation, like a video game with pixels and frame rates. It's, it's r slash hmm, it's suspicious. <laughs> yep. It's suspicious. I think the, the, game, the game devs have not covered their tracks well enough. They have not covered their tracks. They're only running on a quadrillion bit system instead of a quintillion bit system, and it's this is the result. Shoddy yeah. game making, honestly. The universe is run on Windows Vista. Oof. I feel ashamed anyway, to run so on yeah, Windows you know, Vista. The diagram you see on your screen, that is five decillion plank lengths. Yep. <laughs> If you're watching on a computer, at least. Yeah. Um, so yeah, not to scale. 
Yeah. Yeah, not to scale, understatement. Yeah, plank lengths. So plank times. Then there's also things, there's plank energy and plank temp. Well, so there's plank temperature, which is based on the fact that every wave of light, like in black body radiation, has a frequency and a wavelength. And if there was a wave of light that had a wavelength of one plank length, then that would be the highest temperature, highest energy photon that could exist in the universe because any higher energy and its wavelength would be less than a Planck length, which is not allowed. So that's how you get Planck temperature and Planck energy. And then you also get Planck mass because energy is mass. So it's a wild ride of Planck units. And it's interesting because these could be the objective units that we use to communicate with aliens, as we said last episode, <laughs> yeah. because these would be the only objective units that you could find in the universe, so they're pretty interesting, except they're a little unruly, because if you want to <laughs> send over any instructions or any details of anything macroscopic, you have to use things like 5.08 times 10 to the 33, so... <laughs> Yeah. Anyways, I'm going to go to the next slide. Yeah. So next up we have what may be the smallest thing, yeah. depending on your definition, but we have the singularity. A singularity is like the densest thing in the universe. It's the center of a black hole. Yeah. This, yeah, the center of the black hole and is infinitely small. Yep. Like that. That's kind of what we've gathered. And right here we have the first picture of a black hole ever taken, which was taken... Was it this year or last year? I think it was this year. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, this is a historic picture, and people were like, it's blurry. It's like, like, shut up. <laughs> Get out. Leave. Get out. No one cares. It's It's got enough pixels. Yeah. So, yeah. Um, singularity, probably the smallest thing. Yeah. Um, it's what allows, like, black holes to, to occur. It's also, like, terrifying. Yeah. Because, like, it could just destroy everything. Yeah. Of how dead it is. Yeah, and it's, it's interesting because since we don't know what's inside a black hole, we can't tell if the singularity is actually a infinitely small point or if, you know, you hit solid ground 10 feet after entering the event horizon. Nobody knows. We just have yeah. theory and speculation. But if the singularity is actually a singularity and is just a single point, then there you go. You yeah. got the smallest thing in the universe. So yeah. So the future. Okay. The future, future of, of our research into yeah. the smallest thing. Yep. So is the first slide the one that I think it is? It is. Oh no. <laughs> do yeah. I do I dare to change the slide? Yes, you must. <laughs> Uh, vibe check. <laughs> You've been selected for vibe check. <laughs> this is the graviton. And this is the evolution of this slide. I started with my nice purple graphic here. And then I thought, we've been calling our audience gravitons, kind of. Maybe. Sort of. I don't know. If you guys like the name, then comment below gravitons as a fan base but anyways so i got that hand pointing at the audience thing because i was thinking okay it's it's graviton you know and you guys are gravitons but then i was thinking okay this looks a lot like a vibe check meme and sebastian helpfully got that nice little face and put it in there and now it is terrifying yes it is frightening. <laughs> it's even scarier than the, the uh, quantum mechanic ranger with the big iron on his hip. Oh my gosh, honestly. Yeah. Oh, that image. It's so unsettling. <laughs> so the graviton would be the carrier of gravity. And yeah. yeah. So we have particles carrying all the other forces. Yeah. Like weak force, strong force, and electromagnetism. Yep. The only one that's not accounted for is gravity. Yep. So this is the problem, though, with gravity. 
is that how does it travel so far? This graviton has to make quite the trek. It's kind of like the me seeks in Rick and Morty, how they don't want to exist for too long. <laughs> These virtual particles, they don't want to exist for too long. The gluon travels the space between two quarks and then dies. The W and Z bosons, they travel like very short distance and then they decay. The photon, at least the force carrying photon, is spanning the space between two electrons as they approach each other. These gravitons would have to travel immense distances. And that's just not how particles be a lot. So yeah. it would be peculiar. And yeah, so our current conception of gravity with relativity is that it's just a warping of space time, which is not particles, which is not quantum mechanics, which has caused this huge rift and just, it's just a big problem. It's, it's like you have two companies trying to make a merger, but you know, they keep messing things up. They're putting their items in your filing cabinets and you're like, no, no, just because we're merging, we still need to stay organized. We can't just merge all these files. We need to keep the history. And they're like, ah, don't worry about it. And it's like, so that's, that's, that's what's currently going on between quantum mechanics and relativity. And it's not fun. It is not a fun time. They're, they're not figuring out how to reconcile this. I mean, they're trying to, but they're not. Yeah. So it's going to be an interesting ride with plenty of vibe checks and <laughs> plenty of gravitons and plenty of changing theories. And so we had to include the graviton as it would be the last particle in the standard model if it exists and if it gets discovered. Where would yeah. you put the graviton on the tier list? Well, obviously, if this exists and then we can further use this to combine quantum mechanics and general relativity, uh -huh. like, that, that, that goes to, like, double S tier. Nice. Yeah. Because that's like physics' biggest problem is that it doesn't have a unifying theory. Uh -huh. Chemistry's unifying theory being um, subatomic particles and like the periodic table and all that. Uh -huh. Biology's unifying theory being evolution. Yep. The physics doesn't have a one unifying theory. They have quantum mechanics, which is science of very small, mm -hmm. and general relativity, which is like big scale things like yep. gravity and mass of planets and all of that and yeah. like time dilation all of that mm -hmm. they can't agree on stuff because like time and gravity has been observed to like be somewhat connected in quantum mechanics like time is a constant so there's a lot of disagreements so if we could find something to alleviate that disagreement uh -huh. like that would immediately go up to double s tier nice yeah. So gravitons. Yeah. They would be they would be revolutionary and they would be very good if they came around. But yeah. they're in limbo cuz they're not around but they've been predicted and it's just a weird time. So I'm going to go to the next slide. Yeah. Sure. So now we've got prion theory yeah. and you you might note um on this Wikipedia page it says for the protein diseases, see prion. So, yeah, prion, not prion. We are not talking about, what is it, the third level in Plague Inc.? Fourth? Yeah, I think. Third. It, was a, it was an easy level. That was an yeah. easy level. Yeah. It's, yeah. yeah, so prions would be smaller than all of the standard model particles. They would make up these standard model particles. And... It basically stems from the fact that someone's like, okay, why are there 17 particles? That is too many. There should just be two. And so these two can make up everything else. That, that's it. That's, that's the whole, that's the idea. <laughs> yeah, so let's go over to the next yep. one. Where we have it, two, and yes, it's pronounced gif. Uh -huh. Gifs. Swan and an ant, and then many ants. Yeah. Uh, this <laughs> Unsettling. Quick little joke because there are 
the two the two prions are the swan prions, so we don't have to explain that joke to you. Yep. But if we do, you're probably under 13, and you should get the hell out of this video. <laughs> yeah, get off this video. Get off this stream. Um, then, then the anti-prion, it, it says ant, so we have ant. Yep. Funny, funny. Haha. <laughs> Subscribe. Leave a comment. Hit yep. the bell. Yeah, hit the bell, yeah. So, this is a pretty elegant theory. I like how, I like what it does with charge. It does some pretty good stuff. So, let's take a look here. So, the swan prion in the red has a charge of one-sixth, and then the anti-prion has a charge of negative one-sixth. So, we're getting into some deep fractional charges here. So, yeah. you start... Also, I don't know what keeps these things together. I don't know what ties them to each other, but anyway, so you've got a positron with six swan prions, and one sixth times six gives you a charge of one, and the positron indeed has a charge of plus one. Then you get the up quark with five and one, and the these charges added together would get you up to four sixths or two thirds, and the up quark indeed has a charge of two thirds. So you look through all of this and it all makes sense. The neutrino and the photon, which are neutral particles, are 50-50. They have three and three. And that makes sense because the charges cancel out and add up to zero. Down quark also adds up to negative one third. So, and then electron adds up to negative one. So it all, it all makes sense with the charges. And let me show you some decay processes, some Feynman diagrams with prions. So, First one we have is when an electron and a positron come towards each other, since they're a matter and it's antimatter particle, they will annihilate. And they will annihilate and become two photons carrying energy. Which, yeah. at first you think, oh, okay, it just does that. But with the prions, it just makes so much sense. They're swapping, they're swapping three of their prions for three of their antiprions, and then you have two particles that are 50-50, and that, that's the photons. And then if you take a look at neutron decay, which is when a neutron becomes a proton, you see that the down quark gives up three of its antiprions for three nor, uh, swan prions and becomes an up quark. And you see that an anti-neutrino becomes an electron. So it's interesting the way that this whole situation works. Yeah. And then yeah, you've got your bows on there, too. Yeah, I think that this theory, if, like, proven, it's very handy. Because yeah. right now, yeah, there, there are 17 uh, particles on the standard model. Yep. But if we can narrow it down to, like, two, then that's blowing up. Yep. A lot easier. A lot yeah. easier if you just have two. Uh, I mean... It's already fine with 17, but it makes more sense if it's two, because that's just the fundamental, fundamental like, smallest bit of the universe. I don't know. It's nice. I like it. And, but the, it has some problems, though. And I'm not sure if these are addressed, but the basic problem is what keeps these prions together? Does, do you know? I don't know. Do I know? Do no, I, know? I don't know? Let's find out. <laughs> I do not know. So, <laughs> so something keeps them together and it's not charge because they have, I mean, you have six particles with the same charge for the electron and positron. So it's not charge that keeps them together. It's not the kids that keeps them together. So what's keeping them together? <laughs> so it's something. It's something that exists, some force. And yeah. so another problem is that if you look here, not all of the particles are explained. Like, where's the strange quirk? Where's the charm quirk? Where are all the other quirks? Where are all of the heavier muons? Or muon and tau, you know, the heavier leptons. And... What what gives these particles distinction from each other if each of them is just made of six prions, then 
where's your variation? What else can you have? You know, like this is an exhaustive list of all the possibilities when you just have six particles and there's only two possibilities for each particle. So it's, it's interesting. It's an interesting theory, needs some work, but I like it. So anyways, oh yeah. And it also implies an interesting idea. So we all know neutron stars, right? Really dense stars, not quite black holes. They're the size of a city and they're made of neutrons just packed together very tightly. But if the neutrons get packed together too tightly, then they might collapse and become a quark star. And a quark star would be made of just quarks packed together. Now the implications of this are pretty interesting because quarks are meant to be in groups of three. That's just how they, they're, how they like to be. They like to be like that because of the gluon, the gluon, I mean the strong force. And I mean, if you think about it, the binding energy of a proton is 99% of its mass. So the strong force is really strong. And I mean, it's the strong force. It's the strongest of the fundamental forces. It's called the strong force. Basically, this is the TLDR is the quarks do not like to split apart, but there might be enough pressure that the quarks would just become a sort of goopy, like mess and just run into each other. And they might be really densely packed in a quark star. But then you might have a prion star, which would be that the quarks get so tightly packed that they break down and they're actually in a lower energy state as just pure prions floating around. But there is something a little of suspect here with the prion star. And that is that it has a diameter of 10 centimeters, which this is, this is not good. And the reason is the event horizon of a black hole for a star is larger than 10 centimeters. So the prion star would be within the event horizon of a black hole. So would it be a singularity? Is this one of the possibilities of what a singularity might be? Maybe. But with current physics, we'll never know because you cannot look inside a black hole and come back to tell the tale. So... Yeah, it's it's an yeah. interesting situation. It is indeed. So now we get to string theory. Yes. So this is one of the things that can tie together um, quantum mechanics and on the vibrations of like incredibly small strings, and these strings are like about one or two Planck lengths. Mm -hmm. Um. They're like a little longer than a plank length, but yeah. basically, thing is, they would account for all mass. Every particle in the universe would be just an equivalent of these strings vibrating. Yeah. And the vibrations would create mass as we know it in matter, mm -hmm. and this would tie together general relativity and quantum mechanics. Yeah. Much like a string. <laughs> Much like a string. Yeah. Mike! 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 Hit it. hit it, Mike! No. Oh, he's not here. Crazy high dimension strings. And since they have so many dimensions, they have so many ways to vibrate. So one mode of vibration is saying, I have a mass of 2.2 .2 mega electron volts per speed of light squared. And then another vibration is saying, I have a charge of plus one. And then another vibration, it's like all all at the same time, like some crazy orchestra and yeah, it's, yeah. yeah. And so these might be what make up particles. We might just be vibrating strings. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. Anything else on string theory? Um, again, I would refer you to uh, the LD Universe. Yeah, definitely. Right. Very good book. I think he does a very good job of like explaining kind of like what this theory is. And right now there's like a ton of different string theories mm -hmm. that exist. And then there's one theory that ties all the strings together. Nice. <laughs> um, that is called M theory. Uh-huh. Oh yeah, M theory. 
I remember theory, that from the book. It has like 32 dimensions to exist, if I'm remembering that correctly. Uh huh. And um, I think Stephen Hawking, uh, before he died, said that it was like a possibility, and hmm. I think he did put research into it. Um, uh-huh. I'm not sure if he said that he believed in it. Yeah. But he definitely found it plausible enough to do research into. Well, that's that's a nice vote of confidence. It's a nice yeah. endorsement. So. It's a strong contender for a grand unified theory, which is just the merger, you know? Yeah. So, yeah. Final thoughts. So, yeah. Um, my final thoughts on this is that this is um, definitely one of the most useful things to, like, know. Yeah. Um, if you're, if you're going to go into any branch of physics. Yeah. Knowing what makes up the Everything. Us, yeah. It is indispensable knowledge. Yeah. Because it's it can provide so many explanations for so many different facets of yeah. physics. That exactly. You just knowing it will help you in so many different ways. Definitely. Like radioactivity, radioactive decay, if you were looking at anything nuclear that involves this. Even the processes in stars in astronomy, everything, it all ties back to the smallest things, the standard model. And it makes sense. When you know how the subsystem works, you can tell how the entire system works. That's, yeah, that's, that's, that's it. Once you know how things operate on the smallest level, then you can extrapolate and figure out everything on every other level. And that's why this is just so useful. So, but yeah. the true, yeah, the true smallest thing in the universe. It's the brains of the writers of this COPA bill and those who made this COPA lawsuit on YouTube that made it so that we have really annoying like restrictions and things that we have to do now. It's just such a bad, it's such so a poorly written you, bill. I have to see. you really yeah. want to see what the smallest thing in the yeah. entire universe is? Go over to Washington, D.C., <laughs> go over to the FTC headquarters, yep. and ask for the manager. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So thank you guys. Thank you for watching. For watching. Uh, loyal Gravitons. Again, yep. we're sorry that we had to pre-record this. Yeah, we Gravitons. had... Yeah, we, uh, it's vacation, you know, Thanksgiving break, so, yeah. So, yeah, happy Thanksgiving. Yeah, happy well, Thanksgiving. Enjoy... Well, this will be after. We hope you enjoyed the turkey. Oh, yeah. We, oh, yeah because, Past yeah, tense. Yeah. After. So we hope you enjoyed yeah. that turkey or whatever food you chose to consume. Yeah. And, yes, yeah. thank you. Thank for you for watching. And 